I would like to give you some insights into the calculation of carbon and nutrient stocks uh, and what a stock is and why we need it. Um, and that this is critical if we include uh, soil science in any discipline, including sensing, robotics, etc. Um, let me give some background why this uh, can be important. What you see here is the uh, CO2 curve of the atmosphere. Uh, the carbon dioxide in an ice core 800,000 years before present. You remember human beings exist 400,000 years and we see there are some fluctuations. Um, there are some peaks uh, every 100,000 years, um, but we never hit the 300 ppm line. Uh, and that has changed in the last years now. Um, now we are even exceeded the 400 ppm. And uh, now we cannot uh, ignore climate change anymore. This 400 ppm, they are equivalent to, what is this here? They are equivalent to, um, 5 billion tons of CO2 carbon, which we emit too much in the atmosphere. In order to understand how much this is, we can relate to the global carbon cycle. Uh, and then we see here these arrows, they indicate how much carbon we either emit or we take up into our ecosystems, while the points indicate the stocks of the carbon. And when we look at the arrows which go up here, um, then we see, uh, then we see, for instance, we have 9.5 billion tons, which we emit by fossil fuel combustion. combustion. We can add 1.1 billion um, tons, which we add by uh, land use change, which is then 10.6. The red part C is the budget imbalance is uh, minus 0.3. So we can add the uncertainty of 0.3, then we have 9.5 plus 1.1 is 10.6 uh, plus 0.3 is 10.9. And then there's one addition 0.1 from volcanic eruption. So we have about 11 tons of, 11 billion tons of carbon, 11 gigatons, which we emit every year. The uptake are the errors which go in the, the uh, opposite direction. We have 3.1 billion tons, which we take up into <clears throat> the vegetation and the biosphere plus 2.8 which we add into the oceans. This is 5.9 and the difference to the 11 mentioned is the blue number, the 5.1. And this is exactly uh, our what we had in this other figure, the amount which we add too much every year to the atmosphere. Now, if you look at the green dot there, the soils, the soils store about 1,700 gigatons, 1,700 billion tons of, of carbon. Um, globally. And if we calculate that, then this 5.1, which we emit to one is less than four per mil. Uh, so it's a small change compared, uh, which we have too much in the atmosphere, which causes cli climate change compared to, to the whole amount of carbon, which we have in the soils. And that gave rise to the climate conference in Paris, 2015. Um, people just made a similar calculation. 2015, people thought this is here, the, the orange middle line. We still had 1,500 billion tons in soil, not 1,700. And at that stage, we emitted uh, 4 billion tons too much, not 5. But nevertheless, it's the same. So at the reference depth of 40 centimeters, uh, people concluded this is less than 4 per mil. And the idea is if we can increase our carbon stock by four per mil per year, then we do not have any climate change. Technically, this is not possible, but this is not the topic today, but at least a certain portion can be added to the soils up to 1.3 gigatons. Economically, maybe only half of this makes sense. So, but nevertheless, soils cannot solve the climate problem, but they can add to it. Why do I say that? Because we have here a different unit of the um, gigatons of the total amounts compared to the unit we can measure. When you give a soil to, to analysis, you get, for instance, the, uh, the value for an optimal carbon content, which is really high, even 2% um, of soil organic carbon, which would be really a lot. 
which translate then into 20 grams per kilogram carbon of soil. Now the question is, how do you translate that to the carbon stock per hectare? Or if you do the same for phosphorus, a typical concentration in our soils would be 100 milligram plant available phosphorus. How do you translate it to the stock uh, in the surface soil, which is plant available, which then for instance, also derives uh, fertilization demand if the plant take 10% of the stock. Um, how can you convert these units? And I would like to practice that with you with a simple uh, with a simple example. It's an example with realistic carbon concentrations, but the exact numbers are fictitious, but it's a typical example to what happens. If you, for instance, convert a forest surface soil to an arable soil, so, so you deforest, you take the trees out and you use this forest as a rebel land. Then you will measure carbon concentration in the forest topsoil, which was formerly 2% of carbon. And now after maybe 20 years, you have 1% of carbon only in the arable topsoil. The question is, how much carbon did you lose? Is this 50% as it indicates or is it less? So the first thing you have to do, what you have to consider is soil depth. The, the topsoil in the forest is flatter. Um, it is usually only 10 centimeters, while in the arable soil, everything is plowed to 30 centimeters. So in this simple comparison, um, there's a depth interval missing in the forest soil. And below the very top soil, we usually have a bit less carbon, only 1%, for instance. And when we consider the carbon content or nutrient content similar for nutrients in the arable soil, we have to include this mixing in the calculation, how much elements we lose. Um, so we can adjust that. We, we calculate a, a simple weighted average, assuming that the density is similar, the soil mass per depth interval. And then we have in the forest top soil, we have 2% and the top layer plus twice 1% is four divided by three intervals of 10 centimeters. So we add it at, at an average value of 1.3% of carbon. Um, <clears throat> well, in the arable topsoil, we still have the 1%, which is uh, homogeneously distributed because it's mixed in the plow layer. Now, how much did we lose? Um, this figure assumes we lost about 30%, which is also not yet correct because we have to consider how much mass is contained at a certain depth. And uh, <clears throat> for this, we have to know the density. So how much mass of soil is stored in a certain volume? If we take the volume of one liter, so one cubic decimeter, then a typical bulk density of one in a forest soil <clears throat> would translate into one kilogram soil is stored in one cubic cubic decimeter. Um, and in a rebel soil where you have uh, heavy machinery, you may compact the soil. So actually you store a bit more per liter. So you have 1.2 kilogram per cubic decimeter. Now you can calculate from this the soil mass, which you have per square meter. So you have three liters with depth for the 30 centimeters. So you have to multiply the one kilogram by three for three uh, decimeters depth intervals. <coughs> then you have to convert a decimeter square to meter square. So you have to multiply by 100. So you find in one square meter of surface soil average to 30 centimeters, 300 kilogram in the forest. And if you have a bulk density of 1.2, you have 360 kilogram in the arable soil. Now we still have the carbon content. We have 1.3% in the forest soil. So we have to calculate 1.3% from 300. Then we add about, um, <clears throat> we find about four kilogram of carbon in the surface soil of the forest and 3.6 kilogram in the surface soil of the arable soil. We still can convert per hectare, which is the common unit, which would then also go to the climate change scenarios. One hectare is 10,000 square meters. So we have to multiply by, multiply by 10,000. 
And then we find finally 40 tons of carbon in the uh, per hectare in the surface soil of the forest and 36 in the arable soil. So to answer the question, um, we lose about four tons uh, carbon per hectare. We have carbon loss of 10% and not what is indicated by the above concentrations uh, would, would falsely assume uh, 50%. So why did I show this example? It shows you need the bulk density to convert the concentration, which is in percent or which is in gram per kilogram to the really stock, which is the multiplication with the volume. Um, and then you can calculate the total nutrient or carbon storage per area. But this is important because if you don't know bulk density, you do not really know how much carbon or nutrient is really stored in soil. So also ecologically, if you want to, to analyze whether nutrients change with fertilization or with reduced fertilization practices, you always have to multiply with the mass and you need the bulk density. And the problem is usually we don't have that. And all sensing methods um, don't sense the bulk density. It's also a challenge uh, to sampling. Oh, unfortunately, my pen doesn't work, so I cannot show that here. Um, but what I wanted to show you is that if you have a certain soil and you compact it, so you reduce the volume, that means you have one soil you sample, for instance, 20 centimeter, and if the other soil is compacted, your next sampling would go deeper and you have to adjust a different um, different masses and different soil mixing. Now the question is, what can you do? Uh, if you go to an arable field, and this is a field in Seelhausen, which is the test site uh, where also the Rhizotron facility is near Jülich, we see that the carbon contents change by a factor of two along this transect. The right part, which is here in yellow, this is uh, more uphill where the electricity station is standing and down part, which is about 200 meters, if you know the site, um, is more towards the valley bottom, bottom. You can use different sensing tools to, to map that. You can use proximal sensing, you can use remote sensing so that you would be able to get an accurate picture of the carbon content or concentration, content and concentration is synonymous in this case, if we say it in English. Um, but we do not have bulk density, so we do not have the carbon stock. And whatever we sense with whatever technology, we do not have the total stock of the carbon content. And the same is for nutrients. We don't have the stocks of phosphorus. We don't have it for any other nutrient. So all sensing of the soils uh, are not precise. Now, what can we do? Um, there are methods to, to apply uh, environmental sensing also to soils. The most common one is infrared. You, you just take an adsorption spectrum um, and then gives you a different wavelengths. What we use here, which is a machinery we also got from Phenorop, is a mid-infrared spectrum because it shows many signals. And each of these individual peaks, uh, you can assign a certain uh, functional group in soil organic matter or in minerals or in water. Um, to evaluate such a spectrum chemically can be quite complex. And we see also it's a bit wavy and not very, the differences are not very clear. So that's usually what we don't do in sensing, but we use um, statistical methods to deconvolute these spectra, for instance, in the simplest case to transform it into virtual uh, principal axis and then to correlate the soil properties with these principal axis components. You can have other machineries, uh, other, other, other models from neural networks in order to derive a soil property from the overall pattern of the spectra. Not looking individual what a specific band is detecting, but just taking the pattern as an indicator for the soil properties. And this is very fast. The machinery has an auto sampler. Um, so you can analyze 500 samples per week. And that's a rapid soil analysis. 
And this works quite nicely. Um, if you do it for carbon, for instance, you see here is an older study um, from the old CRC, Transregio. Um, on the y-axis, you see the mid-infrared estimated uh, carbon content. And on the x-axis, you see the quantitative analysis. And you see both values lie very close to one one line. The sensing of the carbon content is at least as accurate as the conventional analysis. So that works fine. You then can start to use this technology, which you have in the lab, to um, mount on tractors, for instance. Um, usually, this is done with a light source. And in order to measure the reflectance light accurately, you have to measure the reflectance spectra in the dark. So um, Stefan Petzold constructed um, with the Institute of Agricultural Engineering a dark chamber, which is mounted behind the tractor. And the sensor system with this light is sitting inside. It gives light to the soil. You measure the reflectance spectra, and then you do the same calibrations as you have in the lab. And then you can uh, sense the different uh, salt properties while going with a tractor over the field. You could also do it via drones, then you cannot use easily uh, light reflection. You have to modify this a bit, but actually it works. The problem is you have some, some confounding uh, influences. The biggest one is moisture. Uh, you see here on the left-hand side, in a way, these adsorption curves. Um, and on the uh, x-axis, the different wavelengths, and you see that these curves differ quite significantly for different moisture contents. The upper curve has a moisture content, dark blue of 32%, and the uh, orange curve, they are air-dried soils, which have much less um, <laughs> signal intensity. And you can assume that if you go over soils with different moisture content, then you don't see the organic carbon and organic matter, you actually see the moisture differences. But you can um, make the calibrations more complex. You can adjust it with mathematical models. And finally, uh, you also have to adjust for surface roughness. And you see here the red line, which is quite close to the one-to-one uh, -one line. So it's possible to predict the soil organic carbon content SOCs here, soil organic carbon at variable moisture and roughness conditions under field conditions. The challenge we have here, and that's what we indicated uh, already in the beginning, it is only for a given site you have to perform the calibration. And, and this is the key, any light reflectance measurement or light absorption measurement, it only affects the top one or two millimeters of soil where your sensor signal enters the soil. Every, everything below is invisible. Um, and you only measure the concentration. So how much carbon per kilogram soil you have or how much nutrients per kilogram soil, but you do not have the bulk density, so you do not have the stocks. And any sensing method will miss the whole quantity of the elements in soil. Um, you only can do it, of course, if there's no vegetation on the surface. And uh, this um, infrared spectroscopic me measurements have the additional disadvantage that you don't have a direct signal for nitrate, for instance. So for the really plant available nutrients, it's even more difficult. Now, what can be a solution? You can use different wavelengths by different uh, technologies for sensing. The infrared is quite in the middle. At the very low end range, you can use uh, electric magnetic conductivity, or we go to the very high range, which is then um, the radiation, electromagnetic radiation, especially of the gamma radiation. And gamma radiation means we have a radioactive decay. Some nucleates are not very stable. Yeah, you have a radio radioactive decay. You know it for uranium that it can be dangerous if you have if you're close to radio radioactive decay. And there are different mechanisms of radioactive decay. 
Uh, high energy would be on the left-hand side. It's called an alpha decay, where you really emit um, alpha particles like helium particles. Um, but you can protect from this radiation already with a piece of paper. Higher intensity, you better go into a different room is then the better decay where you emit, for instance, an electron or, or a proton. Um, and the highest energy would be a decay where you miss, you uh, emit only <clears throat> electromagnetic radiation, the gamma radiation in very high energies. And several nuclei emit these energies and for environmental sensing, the most important ones are potassium, uranium and thorium. The origin of this radiation depends where does it come from. Potassium comes from 40 potassium. Uranium is uh, already coming from another element um, of the original source, which is bismuth. Uh, another element is also relevant for thorium. Um, but what we finally detect here is on the, on the uh, black line is a signal for potassium radiation, gamma radiation for uranium and for thorium. It is not very toxic because the concentrations of these elements are very low. So we are not in a critical uh, measurement range, but we can use when we measure with a gamma spectrometer, the background radiation, we can measure the distribution and the intensity of radioactive decays by different elements and environment. Fortunate with this is that you have an intensity distribution of the signals. You see two curves where the signal, that where the detector is uh, placed at different height over the soil. And you see at the first glance that the distribution of the signals is more or less similar, whether you do it by 20, met by 20 meters height, like with a drone or with a plane or helicopter, or whether you directly drive over the soil. And you all also see that these curves have the highest uh, intensity at the very top. And when you go deeper into the soil, so on the y-axis down, um, you see that almost 90% of the signal is in the top 30, 35 centimeters. So what this methodology does, it integrates at least across the whole plow layer. You still don't have the bulk density, but at least you have a sensor signal, which is proportional so the total stocks of the respective elements in the soil. Unfortunate, unfortunately, um, you don't measure the radioactive decay of, of carbon or of any phosphorus atom, but at least of related ones <laughs> like potassium, which is in the clay minerals, and then the clay minerals can absorb the carbon so you can have some indirect assessments. And uh, these detectors, they can also be mounted on a tractor, which you see here on the left. We have two of these detector mounted here and you drive over the field and then you get at different points, you get your measurement signals. And for instance, this is a curve which shows the signals for potassium uh, for the total counts on the uh, X axis. And since potassium is allocated in the middle of the, in the, in the center of the clay layers, you have quite a quantitative uh, estimation of soil clay content. Ton is a German uh, translation of clay here. Um, <clears throat> again, different clay mineralogy means you need to calibrate for different sites. Um, and if you drive very fast, you may also smear your signals. Uh, so, but this can be solved if you, for instance, do a moving window uh, averaging, you measure at five points, then you calculate the average for the five points, and then you move to the next point, it gives you another averaging. Um, so you don't take the measurement value at the single point, but you always measure, uh, you always average over five points and then you continue to drive and this gives you a fairly accurate assessment at the end of the total uh, counts which you have in the field. And it's usually a linear relationship. Here's an example for Seid Dikobshof, 
we just look at the green line. Um, the higher the potassium, the higher the clay content, which usually means the lower the sand content. So the overall correlation is negative. And we see here from the Pearson's correlation coefficients that um, you can get quite a nice um, prediction of sand contents just, just by driving or by flying over the soil. Now, if you go to different regions, um, you see that sand and clay mineralogy is different and these curves are not always the same. So if you use the open dots here, which is Ascheberg near Münster, and you take here a total count of maybe 1000, then you add on the y-axis at the sand content of about 20%. If you would use this calibration and go to other points, uh, like here at the bottom, at the, at the line on the top, you would translate the 1000, not to 20% clay, but actually uh, to 20% sand, but you actually have a 70% sand. So you see the, the calibration function you have, to, which you to predict the soil property in one region does not work if you go to a different region. And we cannot easily just fly over whole Germany and then map all soils in the simplest case, we need a calibration function which is specific to the specific sites, which gives a lot of workload. Now, you all know these machine learning techniques. You can group the spectroscopic measurements uh, according to other properties, uh, as for instance, done by support vector machines. Then you, the model selects specific regression functions for specific areas. And then you see here across different areas, you get quite a nice prediction. So using machine le learning tools can solve the issue that the calibration actually is site specific. It's still not universal, but at least for the areas you work with, you can get a quite a nice uh, prediction of salt properties. We try to improve that by other mix uh, technologies like uh, total scanning of element contents with the specific uh, X-ray fluorescence technology. So we approach the problem. And you also can do it from air. Yeah, you can fly over an area, you mount these gamma radiation devices there, and then you get your air signal. And then you finally can cover large areas by sensing. So, what did I want to tell you today is please keep in mind that the laboratory measurement gives you a concentration, but what is ecologically relevant is not only the concentration, it's how much of the total amount of element you find. So you need the stocks. So the stocks of carbon and nutrients are the um, ecologically relevant unit. In order to calculate stocks, you need to know the bulk density, how, how, density, how densely is the material packed. And we do not really have good tools for environment sensing of bulk density. We can use penetrometers, which gives a point estimate to a certain degree. There are ideas on it, but at present we don't have a reliable tool which can measure bulk density across a large area. And that means um, the most important ecological parameter, how many elements you have, uh, we don't get with environmental sensing. As a compromise, we can use gamma spectroscopy, which at least integrates across the whole plow layer, which gives you some estimations of related properties like clay content or anything which is correlated to potassium. It gives you, doesn't give you a direct estimation, for instance, of the nitrate content. But also with this technology, we miss everything below the plow layer. We can overcome the problem of site-specific calibrations, but we do not access, as, assess anything which is deeper in the subsoil. And with the final slide, I want to show you some data from uh, a recent uh, thesis which is done in Brazil, how much of the elements can be in the deeper subsoil. This is a reforestation site in Brazil. And just look at the middle curve 
uh, with RE, which means reforestation, compared uh, <clears throat> to, for instance, secondary forest on the right, we see that these green uh, bars on the top is above ground carbon accrual, which is a bit different as among sites, but the big larger, the much larger difference is in the deep subsoil between uh, one and two meters depth. And many ecological changes happen just below the plow layer, also in arable ecosystems. And we miss all this information at present by environmental sensing. And also if you use robots to um, analyze the sustainability of any environmental measure, you must be aware that more of half of all element stocks, uh, you do not sense at all. And uh, you also do not have the correct bulk density. So you have actually to guess how much is in your field, which makes a precise assessment of sustainability difficult. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and are open to any questions.